I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. Earlier this year, we published the Daily Observations by Bridgewater founder and CIO mentor Ray Dalio, where he described his five big forces framework and how these forces will shape 2024 and the years to come. And we'll link to that here. Considering all that's happened in just the last three months in markets, economies, and certainly on the geopolitical front, I thought it'd be interesting to sit down with Ray to get his latest thinking on these dynamics. We did that last week, and today we're sharing an edited version of that conversation. Ray hits each of the five big forces and elaborates on where we stand with each, and he also discusses how these forces connect with each other. So in today's podcast, you'll hear Ray discuss the debt, money, and economic force, including Ray's thoughts on the potential for Fed easing when inflation remains above target, as well as portfolio considerations in today's environment. He also discusses the internal order force, that's the second force, with an emphasis on the 2024 U.S. presidential election. He hits on the external world order force, including rising geopolitical conflicts and Ray's read on what's happening in China. He talks about the force of nature, notably climate change and its economic consequences. And lastly, he talks about the force of human inventiveness, including the potential for AI to bring radical change in the coming years. We start off with a question from Mita Ray on his five big forces overall. Ray, it is good to see you. I believe you're in Connecticut. Is that correct? Yep. It's good to know that you're back on U.S. soil because you've been all over the world and there's a lot going on in the world right now. I think everyone knows we're two years into a global tightening cycle with markets pricing in Fed easing right around the corner. Even though inflation's still running uh, above target, we've got geopolitical strife seemingly getting worse, not better, as as we see conflicts between Russia and Ukraine continuing between Israel and Gaza. There's a simmering conflict on the north uh, of Israel and Lebanon that could even be more explosive. We have, of course, the China and Taiwan situation. Stocks, gold, Bitcoin are all making new highs. We have a consequential U.S. presidential election approaching at a time of, as you've noted many times, ever-increasing polarization. We have Radical new technology in the form of AI, um, which has huge implications for productivity and the profitability of a subset of companies. And and of course, we're in the midst of a, of a climate crisis. I thought it'd be a perfect time to once again sit down with you, get your thoughts on how you're seeing these kinds of big dynamics in the world. And from today's conversation, I thought we'd do that by first asking you to briefly describe your five big forces which can explain a a lot of what we're seeing. And then we can delve a little bit deeper into each of them and look at how they're playing out across countries. So welcome. And let's get right into it with uh, your overview of of these five big forces. Yeah. So, you know, because I learned in my lifetime that many of the things that surprised me, surprised me because they never happened in my lifetime before, I learned that I needed to study history. And I saw that many of them repeated through history. And sometimes we lose the big picture because we're squinting at the details. And I went back over history over the last 500 years, really to first deal with uh, the first three big forces that hadn't happened in my lifetime. And then I saw the other two. The first is the amounts of debt creation and then monetization of the debts when the um, uh, there isn't enough money in terms of the supply and demand for credit and its impact on the economy and the value of the dollar. So I wanted to study the rises and declines of reserve currencies over that 500 years. Uh, The second is the degree of conflict, internal conflict, of populism on the left and the right, uh, creating irreconcilable differences that um, are Uh, threatening the democracy, threatening the system in many ways, the amount of the wealth gaps and uh, values gaps that are behind that, and the amount of uh, political polarity, not uh, uh, voting across party lines and the like, the greatest since 1900. And the third, of course, is the great power conflict, global, geopolitical, great conflict between rival power, particularly China, vying for power. You know, last time that happened, and last time all of these happened, was the 1930 to 45 period. 
And then I learned by studying the last 500 years and, uh, and before that um, acts of nature, uh, droughts, floods, and pandemics had an even bigger impact than all of those other things that I've mentioned. Um, uh, they killed more people. And they toppled more orders, more domestic orders, more international orders than uh, the first three. So uh, climate is a big deal, and it's certainly a big deal now. And then uh, number five throughout history, um, the inventions of new technologies, man's learning and inventing of new technologies, um, and uh, not only their economic implications, but their war and military implications, but um, the repeated time through history of discovering weapons secretly, finding the weapons that you show the other side and the other side submits because they can't beat the weapon. That dynamic has also, also been in history. And these cannot be looked at as individual things because they're interdependent. For example, the United States being overextended and, you know, we're in 80 countries and then uh, fighting two wars, you could have a third war on another front, has economic implications or climate has economic implications. And to see them transpire in cycles for logical reasons that the cycles exist were discoveries in my framework. So those are the things. I think almost anything that you mentioned and anything that's important falls under one of those five categories, and they certainly relate to each other. Yeah. And on that front, you know, you wrote at the beginning of the year, we asked you to write your thoughts about 2024. And, and if you hit on the first big one, that's sort of the debt money markets economy force, you you noted then that in a, in a wire, which we'll link to here, that that force was moderately low when looked at in isolation due to the current market pricing being roughly in line with fundamentals and a lack of sort of big problems associated with that force on the horizon that couldn't be well managed. But you also said that the risk rises significantly when you consider in conjunction with the internal order force and you cited the 2024 elections and the external order force. And so I'm wondering if you could update us now as you look at this debt, money, economy for us, um, how you assess it right now in connection to those other two threats you were talking about? Well, there's certainly not going to be enough money. You know, you can get the money from two places. You can tax it or you can uh, print it. So if we look at the, the situation of the, of the central government um, and you do the projection, um, you can see how the combination of the higher debt service payments uh, together with um, the needs for greater defense spending, um, greater climate spending, and, and then you take the entitlements and other things, you're seeing a debt service crowding out of consumption happening in the budget deficits. And then you're also seeing supply demand issues of selling those bonds to the rest of the world because um, no longer are they as attractive and as a percentage of their poor for, of foreigners' portfolios, they're an issue. So we certainly have something that you cannot extrapolate mm -hmm. into many years before we have that particular problem. I think let's talk about the bond market for a moment and easing that's built into it. Um, so I think that there's a mistaken popular view that there should be an easing. So if you look at the uh, or magnitude of easing, that is um, the largest since I think it's like 1981 or two, there's a lot of uh, discounting. I, mean, I think it's um, nearly 200 base points in the next two, uh, two years kind of discounting. Now, so let's step back and say, uh, what should the rate structure be? Now, I, I, I think if you uh, just uh, look at what the equilibrium levels are, which um, I mean uh, appropriate that there is um, a real interest rate that's high enough for the creditor without being too high for the debtor, which, by the way, becomes a difficult balancing act the more debt you create. 
and and you look at let's the inflation rate, um, you can pick the number of what people think the inflation rate is. A lot of the, those numbers would be in the vicinity of uh, two two and a half would be, I would say below three percent, but whatever it is, two and a half and three percent. And then you take the long rate; it's about two hundred basis points. So that brings you up in the vicinity of the bond yield in the vicinity of a of a five percent, four and a half and five percent level, given uh, a normal equilibrium. I think there's a strong tendency to believe that the yield curve should be um, positive. I think that if they um, and eventually it'll settle out to be positive. But if you're looking at then the existing level of inflation, it certainly um, is not at target, and they they will ease up on that target. They will probably accept an inflation rate at two and a half to three percent. Uh, but you're, you, as you as, as you bring that up, and then you look at uh, the, the existing uh, conditions, the ge- existing uh, stress levels that exist and the form of the economy, the form of the markets, form of credit spreads, and so on. Um, and you say, uh, this is uh, definitely too easy. What's wrong with the existing monetary policy, the existing term structure of interest rates in terms of uh, growth and inflation? Is growth and in, in infl- inflation such that uh, growth is too low and inflation is too low and that you should have a stimulant monetary policy? That is under the normal set of circumstances. If we now say then what are the risks to those scenarios, um, I, I would say the risks are of significantly higher um, I- issues of inflation and so on for, uh, for issues pertaining to the political issues. And that, we'll probably get into that. But how tariffs will rise um, how other things will take place the and what's going on geopolitically creates another risk. And then there's the supply demand. So when I look at the bond market, I think the bond market um, is uh, at, a, at a, around these levels, um, a appropriately uh, priced in that vicinity of four and a half, I think probably longer term. It's not going to, uh, that's too low. Um, and then if I take the slope of the yield curve and where the short rates are and where the existing rates of inflation are and so on, I think that that's uh, operating uh, well. So yet there's a 200 basis point easing and we still have the big budget deficit um, and current account deficit uh, issues going on. Let's explore inflation a bit more, focusing on the fiscal policy side, Ray. You've made the point that politically, neither of the presidential candidates has an incentive to rein in spending. The Biden administration doesn't want to see too much of a constraint going into the election. And it really doesn't appear that Trump and his people really want to spend less either. So I think the picture you're painting here is a hotter inflationary environment than's currently priced in the interest rate markets. Can you walk us through how you're thinking about that? Well, there's two issues. There's first the inflation rate. And second, there is the supply demand for the bonds. If I'm looking at the inflation rate um, and I look at the core levels, particularly income levels and spending levels, and then um, and and then I um, I, I come up with I don't know let I come up with about three percent. It's two and a half. I don't really know the difference. So I, I'm happy to say that by any measure, we are not at the 2% targeted. So we're above that. And current, one would say, is in that vicinity. That's not much of a disputable question. And then you could add on uh, what, you know, what, what I said about rates before. As we go forward in terms of the supply-demand issue, we know that we're going to have a lot more supply. Yeah. I'm talking about money, supply of money before we get to supplying of stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, on the supply of money, um, uh, uh, what we know is um, that there is not going to be any remediation. In fact, 
there is going to have to be increase in spending. And if you take where the geopolitical situation is, not only internally, but I said geopolitical, internationally, and you look at what, for example, the defense budget is, okay, it's a 1% increase in the in the budget, which is a negative real um, decrease. Um, that is a pressing issue that people on both sides uh, recognize, and um, they don't want to talk about it right now in terms of that issue. But that's not going to be a sustainable amount that we're um, in the world. Mm-hmm. And then in, if you then take into consideration the climate issue, and the climate issue one way or another, that's estimated to be about $8 trillion a year, which is required. And we're not going to spend that. We're spending about one-sixth of that, which means also one of the reasons we're not anywhere near approaching holding temperature increases at one and a half degrees. Because, But anyway, it's um, that that's 8% of world GDP. There's a lot of spending. And then there's the north-south south issue. Um, and, and then we're looking at the world and you say, who's going to afford these various things? You look at Europe and, and you know, OK, we say Europe should take care of its defense in, in terms of those things. Well, Europe has its own issues and so on. So what we have is um, the need or more uh, the demands for higher am- amounts of spending that are even put into that budget and those budgets. So the risks of those are on the upside. And if you just take what is projected and then you apply the debt service payments to that, the maturity of the debt and the amount of interest payments that has to be on that debt, that is creating a classic squeeze. In other words, I've seen this repeatedly happen throughout countries. And this this financial, this is not sound, strong finances in right. which there's a good income statement and a balance sheet. So the value of debt assets is a function of these types of things. And so um, as we come into a world also of greater conflict, the um, it has to be recognized that a, a debt asset is a risky asset to hold because conflicts themselves create greater needs. And then there's also a settlement problem in terms of what is the asset that is exchangeable around the world. If you study markets during wars, and I've studied markets during wars, um, allies don't accept each other's money because of the fact that that money, that debt that they'll take on, they know that country is going to get into more debt and probably have to monetize the debt, and they don't even know what will happen at the uh, end of that. So the risks, literally, of holding money, debt, debt assets during wars or different types of uh, uh, assets during wars uh, are, are high and lurk in the back, not to mention then the issues pertaining to the uh, possibility, possibility of unacceptable disruptions in supply lines. Let me explore a couple, a couple of things you, you said. So this sort of demand supply mismatch for U.S. paper, or for that matter, many governments around the world. So this is a threat to, to, to uh, fiat currency. This is basically what you're, you're raising. You've been talking about this for a while. You know, we do see gold, for example, making new nominal highs. We do see Bitcoin uh, making uh, highs. I mean, part of that is structural in terms of the development of an ETF. But still, the demand is uh, is there. I would presume that given what you're saying, you would say that those market dynamics that we're seeing right now are not surprising. No, I, let me step back and say that the most important thing that everybody should start with is a balanced portfolio. The, up until now, we've been talking about what might happen. Okay. But if you put aside the uncertainties of the supply, demand, and such things, and you think about what is a balanced portfolio, what are my risks so that I have symmetrical uh, risks so that I can go through any environment, one would have greater amounts of those assets, uh, inflation hedge assets, that are the type of money. Okay, so let me just pause on that for, let's say, gold. Um, Bitcoin is uh, another topic, but it's a related topic. Uh, Money that I 
can go from one place to another with, and it's accepted around the world. It's sent, accepted by central banks. Today, by the way, gold is the third largest reserve after dollars and euro. And so it's a money that's accepted. And um, as the saying goes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset that is not somebody else's liability. Mm-hmm. Other ones, you're depending on getting paid. This one, you're not depending on possession, you know, is the law, in, essentially. And um, it has uh, a negative co- correlation, significant negative correlation with the top of the typical portfolios, which have a lot of equity beta in them, but equity or bond beta, it has, if you take any of the major crises, you see that that movement out of money in that sort of way cause a spike in gold and that if you take a portfolio optimizer and you were to say, what if I was to overlay gold in my portfolio, add it, it would reduce the risk and increase the expected return if you add that into a portfolio. So the issue is at this time, given all the sets of circumstances, why wouldn't you move to a more balanced portfolio? Why wouldn't you do those exercises in order to consider that? Now let's move to the internal conflict force. You know, we have elections approaching all over the world, including probably the most consequential election right here in the United States and on the presidential level, and it's shaping up to be a rerun of the last one. You've been very vocal on the dangers you see in the polarization in the United States and elsewhere. So I'm wondering if you can give us your thoughts on how you're seeing the internal conflict force, particularly as it pertains to the U.S., and what the consequences could be of either a Republican or a Democratic victory. When I did the study, uh, it was like watching the, the movie over and over again. Uh, there, there's this movie that happens, and, and what it is is when there are big wealth and values gaps and... Um, You have populism, which means uh, that people get fed up of not having their own needs taken care of, and they reject that old political system that doesn't deliver for them. Then you have irreconcilable differences in which you have to pick a side and fight. And then that calls into question the system and whether the system is fair. Is the legal system fair? Is the Supreme Court fair? Or has it been corrupted by the politicalization? Is the media balanced and so on? The And are we working to compromise and to, or are we having irreconcilable voting blocks and decision blocks That means it's black and white, and you have to get on one side or the other. And we haven't seen that in our lifetimes before. And so when I wrote the book, everybody thought it was crazy. This was before there was January 6th, but I've seen this happen repeatedly. There's a cycle, and there's a norm for that. And that is what we are in. So when we look at the upcoming elections, the first questions that we ask ourselves is, is this election going to progress normally? And then if the election progresses normally, where will that lead us because of how the different sides have different views and how will they work together to achieve results? So in other words, politics is normal. So we have some reasonably concerning issue that you may not have an acceptance of the outcome in that normal way. We are getting to the point that it is conceivable that they will not be in acceptance and you get a civil war-ish type of reaction. I know my words are evocative. I don't mean them to be evocative, but it could very well be that the states do not listen to the federal government on decisions, that they say, no, make me. And then you have a breakdown of that kind of a system. And I know that this sounds evocative to to most people, but if you read history and you see what's happening 
that has to be considered as a possibility as we look at these types of elections. Um, it's certainly the case. If you have an election and it progresses normally, let's say, and Donald Trump is elected, which, by the way, might mean less of a risk of the fight because the Democrats might accept that. I, they may not accept the policies. I think you're going to likely have the politicalization of the government. In other words, we know that there's a plan underway to take many civil servants and get rid of those civil servants and to replace those that who are on his side. And that there is a movement now, like you're, you're with him or you're against him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and think about the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's that element of the dynamic, which is a reality. I'm not making this up. Okay, so how does government work? It's more going to be, do you have more congressional investigations for political reasons? Now, let's assume that that's all not a problem and everything runs smoothly. Then we can go on to what the policies are. Donald Trump's policies are going to be more nationalistic, isolationist, free markets, more, uh, more capitalist, um, and so on. Um, and that'll have consequences. That'll have consequences in inflation, trade, and world affairs, because geopolitical part of the world affairs means that the United States will not be the same kind of ally, but nor will it have to have the associated expenses of being the same mm -hmm. kind of ally, but it will then start to produce consequences, geopolitical consequences, as there is a retrenching from some of the war areas. So now let's contemplate if Joe Biden is elected. You're probably not going to have Joe Biden because yeah, he probably will not be in the condition, at least this is popular thinking, that he probably will not be in the condition um, to be the president all through that, that particular term. And so, the, and, and there's some question, of course, as to whether Trump would be too, but more so uh, Biden. And, and so when there's the election, there is the question of uh, what is a democratic po policy? What, what will the Democrats? The Democrats are split. There are moderate Democrats, and then there are extremist Democrats. In other words, extreme leftist de Democrats that would um, arrange big um, transfers of wealth. Our country is not in good shape. In other words, if you look at the financial condition, the infrastructure, the education, um, and those types of things, uh, we're in a hole. We, and so by being in a hole, um, it's not like um, somebody isn't going to pay. And those who will pay will be uh, the rich and the uh, corporations. Yeah. So now you start to think about what does that mean for cor corporate taxes? And what does that mean for markets? So when we think about that, we remember uh, what it meant uh, when Donald Trump got elected. And the number one thing is what is... The, you know, the stock is worth it, its after-tax uh, net cash, the present value of its net cash flows. And so if taxes go up, that is like interest rates going up. It's a, it's a negative on uh, the markets and so on. And it also can produce conflict. You might see, and I would say you're likely to see, greater polarity in, um, in the decision-making and having unreconcilable differences. There are differences. These differences aren't just about people's money, which they care a lot about. These differences are also about values. So there are ir irreconcilable differences that seems to me makes the uh, political situation in the United States uh, an important situation. And when I relate it to the other forces, the, the financial force, or I relate it to the geopolitical force, it's more threatening because geopolitically, other countries are probably going to take advantage of what is happening in the United States. On the external conflict force, I'm wondering where you think we stand and what the future holds. We've we've got a stalemate that maybe Russia is winning that stalemate in the Russia-Ukraine war, and there's a lack of 
funding willingness on the part of the West, particularly the United States. And then we also have the conflict that simmers underneath the surface. It's not a hot conflict, but the Taiwan issue and China-Taiwan. And of course, the other conflicts uh, going on. So when you look at this, are these top of mind? And do you think that any of them are particularly going to become more acute in some way that would raise risk premiums looking out over the course of this year and into next? Or are they sort of stable for the moment in your view and um, not top of mind uh, because there are other factors that are that, that are affecting what's going on? Um, I think that uh, it's less important to look at everything through the wars and the conflicts that are happening as much as you're looking you should look at the allies and the dynamic that is behind that. Okay, so both are going on. There is a local conflict between, in the Middle East, Israel, Gaza, or, or uh, Hamas, Palestinians, and then other regional entities. And there is a uh, certainly a Russia, Ukraine. But um, you have to keep in mind that there's that's a manifestation to a large extent of a greater conflict that has to do with um, associated common interests uh, regarding the powers that be in the world, such as a China, Russia, Iran. And so when we look at that in that way, we, uh, we're seeing both sides play out. So you're seeing, for example, the money and support test. In other words, Europe and the United States, okay, how much money will you put into it and how much support will you put into it becomes um, a test. And we know the consequences of that. And that test, we it also means um, it's a drawdown of resources. Um, in other words, literally, our capacity to produce military equipment and the um, inventories of mi military equipment are depleted and even the modernization of military equipment is depleted and that's a fact and that's a fact globally and it's also a relevant flat fact because of um, the fact very classically in the great empires at this stage in the cycle they are overextended because they have militaries all around the world. The United States has militaries in 80 countries. And um, those originally, um, those presences in other countries were profitable. That's what the empire did. They, they made them profitable and they were profitable. Well, they can become very unprofitable. And so when we look at these issues, it also becomes a political issue domestically as to what is the United States' position, not only an economic question, but will what wars will the United States fight? Okay, what will you lose people? Will you lose unacceptably in different locations? In that, that may be in Europe or um, in Middle East, or it may be in Asia. And that is an issue that's a geopolitical game issue. Before we move on from the external conflict force, I want to zoom in on China because, Ray, you just wrote a new daily observations and it was titled In China, the 100 year storm on the horizon and how the five big forces are playing out. In that piece, you describe what's currently happening in China, both economically and otherwise, in the context of what has transpired over the past century. We'll link to that piece here, but I'm wondering if you could just share with our listeners how you're seeing China today in terms of its trajectory, its leadership, and of course, the power conflict with the U.S. Chinese are culturally, they've had, you know, many thousands of years of um, civilization and it meaning it's like watching the movies over and over again, the rises and declines of dynasties. And there's a cycle. And I think they kind of understand where they are in that cycle. And then there's the basic thing to know about it is that um, be strong, be powerful. Um, and if you're strong and powerful, 
that will determine your position and know how to play your position. And it's very much an extension of Confucianism, which is an extension of the family and hierarchy. So you know your position. Your position means that if you're in a position of power, that you behave in a certain way with those of lesser power. And they call that the tribute system. Uh, in other words, the one who has lesser power should respect those with has greater power. And those with greater power should be treat those with lesser power well. And you never want to occupy a country and, and make it do the things it doesn't want to do. Those policies never work. You're not going to occupy and make a people operate by a religion or a way that they, they don't want to operate by that. That's a force against nature that what you want to do is, is find out, well, what do you want from them and what do they want from you and have good trading relations with them and so on and to more, I would suppose, manipulate them or um, operate that way. And so when we're applying it to the ex existing set of circumstances, it is um, in their minds um, natural and admirable that their power increased as it it did. Now, you know, since I started going there, 1984, per capita incomes increased by 29 times, and, and life expectancy is greater than 10 years greater, and poverty rates of like being hungry went from 88 percent to less than one percent, and it's been quite a remarkable uh, arc. And that then there are these things like the big cycle that I'm talking about in terms of now we're at a, they're at a different phase in the big cycle where what happens is you're not going to have the same growth and then you have a debt crisis and then you have uh, the great power conflict. So you no longer can hide your power. So now you're a threat. Now you have the dynamic. And the question is, how do you play that dynamic? I urge the people to read the piece that I wrote, which describes then how that's operating. He is now operating, she is operating much more in elite, what's called in traditional history of, of that a legalist way, which is um, a, a very strict behavior way with a uh, Marxist male, male uh, is, um, type of overcome. What that means, it, it should be understood. So they view it as the United States is a declining power that is trying to contain it. And then uh, there's the associated rivalry uh, with that. So now, of course, both countries have, they have um, these domestic issues. The domestic issues, I would, I would say, is whether they, whether they operate in a way that they have an economically lost decade with a, let's, let's say, a Maoist Marxist tilt, or whether they do a big restructuring, a debt restructuring and so on, is going to be in their court. And it's a greater risk that they will have that. If they have that, that uh, I think that their basic view of that is that it's disruptive and undesirable, but it's not going to bring them to where they were before, and that the population, uh, which can be spoiled and corrupt in their view, um, uh, has got to get in shape uh, because we have to prepare, they would say, that we have to prepare for the 100-year storm on the horizon. So I would say I would describe the perspective as being uh, along those lines, and I would say um, th the same issues are existing in in their various ways in the United States. We talked about the United States, and they're I think um, describing it as there's a hundred year storm on the horizon, which by the way brings us back. If you go back a hundred years, that's uh, you know you go back ninety years, you're probably that's where you are. Um, and so I think that that's the perspective. And the only way that you uh, handle that well is to be uh, strong. So uh, to do the right things, to bring the populations together and to be productive and strong, um, that is be 
what will determine how these things transpire in the end. And um, also to be able to compromise rather than to destroy the other. So, Ray, as we hit the two other forces, one of one of them is, of course, productivity and new invention and human inventiveness. And this is something you've been looking at carefully. So walk us through a little bit how you're thinking about uh, AI and, 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 a, and a potential productivity miracle and what it would look like. Through history, we have seen um, that the human has evolved almost the, with their body parts, different body parts from the bottom up um, being replaced by machines. Um, so in the agricultural age, the uh, human was uh, like oxen, and uh, then we had tractors. And, and then in the Industrial Revolution, we had machines that would replace that, and then increasingly we had AI, and there's been a continuous process of its uh, evolution that has uh, been essential to my personal and Bridgewater's development um, over that period of time, in which we went through um, using expert systems um, to develop that. And um, now um, there is the generative AI and large language models, which is a tremendous tool that uh, will accelerate that. And so I could say, you know, without a doubt that it will be a fabulous tool in all dimensions and will be in investing. So along those lines, it is going to be a tremendously transformative influence. And, and we're just talking about AI. Um, when we take other technologies that are also uh, transformative. So that has to do with everything from quantum computing to um, uh, 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 genetic sequencing to um, studying the imaging of the body um, at a molecular level um, and um, so many different forms, new energy sources and it, um, and and so many different things, the technologies that are accelerating because the brain is being um, significantly improved. When you increase your muscles, the power of your muscles with tractors and um, other things, um, and that's one thing. But when you increase the power of the mind to invent and to deal with things automatically, that's a whole different level of advancement. And that's what we're seeing. So I think if I take these five big forces that we're talking about, um, and I look out, I count out one year, two years, I think that in three to five years, it's, it's going to be like going through a time warp. We're going to see a radically different world uh, that these things are going to come to a head the things that we're all talking about, and then in this AI world. So the world is going to be a very, very different world in the future. And then I take climate, which we just touched on, but we really didn't get into. Climate is going to have a, a big effect um, in, in lots of different ways. Droughts, floods, and pandemics have throughout history, as I said, have this huge effect. And so we're going to experience that. We're going to, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And then it has implications because it has implications on world water supplies, temperatures, uh, in which will in, lead to migrations of people. It'll change economic behaviors in a lot of different ways. These things are all happening. And so um, I, I think when we step back and we look at all of that, we can say these big things are happening. There are lessons from the past that we can learn. And at the same time, we mustn't be arrogant in thinking that we can anticipate well all the convergence of those things. And we have to think, how do we structure a portfolio well so that regardless of what happens, we're going to be okay? Ray, thank you so much for your time. I love doing this with you. And I look forward in several months to sitting down again and doing it 
all over again to, to hear your thoughts on the five forces. So thank you so much. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and look forward to engaging with you more on our latest research through the Bridgewater Daily Observations. We also encourage you to rate and comment on today's episode. Your feedback helps us to improve, and it helps us to answer your most important investment questions. Thank you very much. For additional information and other important disclosures, please see the full disclosures at the bottom of today's observations on the Bridgewater Client Observatory.